Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you for coming to um, to speak with me today. Sure. Um, so, what are you here to speak with me about today? Uh, I'm here to talk about the web. Okay. And I'm here to talk about some of the work that we're doing in the W3C, and in particular in the TAG, the Technical Architecture Group, which is the group that I co-chair. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that. It all sounds very dry and full of three-letter acronyms and uh, not very related to, you know, interesting things in the world, especially at, you know, 6.30 on a Friday. But um, actually, it's stuff that makes me really, it makes, my, it makes me passionate, it makes me excited uh, about the web and about, you know, you know, the future, basically. So. Mm. Um, so where does the tag sit in the W3C? Like, what's its relationship to other groups? So I'm glad you asked that. Okay. So the W3C, you know, uh, most people, I think, watching this will know what the W3C is or will know at least what HTML is, right? Um, W3C is the standards group. Uh, it's not technically a standards group. That doesn't really matter. But, you know, it's, it's the standards group that works on standards that are related to web technologies, right? Mm. And uh, famously was set up by Tim Berners-Lee in the mid-90s. Uh, it's a consortium, actually, of three, initially three different academic institutions, uh, MIT in the U.S., uh, Arisem in um, Europe, and Keio University in Japan. Um, it's since also uh, uh, gained at Beihang University in Beijing as part of that consortium. So W3C is, is a, is a, as an organization, is, is a kind of amalgam uh, of, those, of those things. And it still very much functions as a standards development organization, an SDO, that works on things relating to the web, the web platform. Mm. And to answer your question, the tag is a special group within W3C. Within W3C, there are two groups that are that are kind of steering committees. One of them is the technical uh, uh, architecture group, which is more focusing on web technologies um, and also the architecture of the web, right? Um, and the other is the advisory board, which is you know, also comprised of technical people, but but uh, focuses more on how W3C operates. Where should they have meetings? How should the funding happen? How should they be doing? How should they be looking for new members? Um, what should the patent policy updates be? All that kind of stuff, which is also extremely important for how W3C operates and how it functions. Yeah. So it, you say it's like more of a, has like a higher level view of what's going on as a, on the technical level within the W3C? It, well, the way that we're functioning right now is we do we spend an awful lot of our time doing reviews of other people's work, mm -hmm. and that's by design. When in 2013 we kind of rebooted the tag uh, a little bit, and we retooled it to, uh, to specifically to function more as a design review body or as a, spe a specification review body. And we wanted to make it a place where other people who are developing specifications, like let's say you're developing the geolocation specification, the web geolocation specification. Um, we wanted to make TAG a place where people who are developing that spec, uh, the group chair, the, the editor of the specification, people within the group um, feel comfortable and feel like it's going to add value to what they're doing to come to the tag to ask for a review. Does this fit into the web architecture? Is this, um, you know, is this using best practice as we know it? Um, are there other things that the tag can offer? Can the tag, you know, because the tag looks across all of these different technologies as they're being developed, can we find similarities or things that we could? Um, the similarities between one spec and another spec that could that could be that could be better utilized, right? You know, um, uh, could, could we be facilitating things a bit better? That's something that we do, and also we do stuff like that outside of W three C too. So things. So on occasion, we talk to people in IETF, for instance, the HTTP working group. 
Um, increasingly, we're talking to people in the Watt WG group as well. I don't want to go into the kind of like details of how W3C and Watt WG function together, but you know, suffice to say, you've got a lot of the same people that are working in both groups. W, uh, the tag, uh, we tend to talk to a lot of people in what in what WG as well, or in what WG work streams as well, um, because re in reality, they're very closely aligned with W3C work. So, yeah. so what is it about the technical architecture group you, you came to talk to me about today in particular? Well, um, I wanted to, I mean, one of the things that we do, a couple different things. So first of all, um, we tend to do a lot of developer outreach. We tend to try to raise awareness of the work of the tag, not only because we want people to know what's going through our pipeline, we want people to kind of, we want to be able, we want to be a force for good in terms of demystifying standards work and also trying to encourage more developers to get involved in, this, in the standards work itself. And in some cases, when we're doing a um, what we call a design review where uh, somebody has developed a specification and they've come to us for a review and maybe they've got maybe there's a uh, you know an early version of this which is part of a very early build of Chrome or some other browser and um, you know they want us they want us to give feedback well that can also be a good time for developers to chime in so our design reviews are actually run on github Everything we do is in the public, in the clear. Um, we get these spec developers to come in and um, uh, raise a design review issue with us. We have a template that uh, sh tells them all the information that they need to fill it. But yeah, it's all done in the clear. Spec developers or spec authors come to us and they ask for a, a review. Uh, they fill out a template. Uh, you know, it's typical work style. They can refer to their own issues because many of these specifications are being developed in other places in GitHub anyway. Um, so they tell us, you know, we need a review. We're interested in your feedback on X, Y, Z. Here's our explainer document about what the specification is, and can you please review it? So that that's an ideal time for actually for developers as well to get to you know raise um, to give us. Uh, some attention and to uh, to have a look as well and maybe feedback on our issue, right? So even so, even though in general we're having a discussion in those issues between members of the tag and usually people who are uh, other people working in standards or the spec and or the spec authors themselves, mm -hmm. the group chairs, what have you, um, it's also a good time for people to honestly to give us their feedback. Say, you know, this would be really useful to me or this is not going to be helpful or uh, you know, this breaks XYZ accessibility issue, right? Yeah. Um, speaking of that, the other thing that we do in the tag is we encourage people who are asking for a design review, we encourage them to look through certain checklists and certain information like, um, have you looked at this from an accessibility standpoint? Have you looked at this from a security and privacy standpoint? Um, have you read our design, our API design guidelines? Um, those are things that we're looking to do more of. And one of the things we're that looking to, more, to write more guidelines. We're looking to encourage developers or spec developers when they're requesting a tag review to be thinking about to to already have gone through a lot of these guidelines mm -hmm. um, and already have been thinking about these things. Um, because it's what we're going to be evaluating when we look at the specification. We're going to be looking at it with these things in mind. Um, so on that note, one of the areas that we are, we're actually looking to expand that, and I'm doing some work right now, thinking about how we could be applying more ethical guidelines to the development of web technologies. What, what kind of ethical thinking did you have in mind here? And the W3C, in many ways, is, is already and is already seen as um, very strong on certain ethical principles. So things like internationalization, uh, accessibility, um, and security and privacy, which I already mentioned, um, are, are kind of baked into the culture 
of W3C. Mm -hmm. W3C, everybody in W3C sees those issues as important. And not only important, but essential, that their assess accessibility is, is a non-optional feature. Um, yeah. Privacy in increasingly is non-optional as well. And uh, we have the security and privacy self-check, which kind of gives spec developers a lot of ideas about what they should be looking for in their spec when they're evaluating it to understand, does this promote user privacy, right? Yeah. So those are, those are topics that are already kind of getting into this area of tech, tech ethics. Um, what we're proposing is to kind of, or I should say, this is work that I'm doing right now, and you know, with some positive support and positive um, feedback from TAG members as well as from other people in the W3C community, where I presented, presented this to the uh, advisory committee uh, about three or four weeks ago and had pretty good response. So besides privacy and security and internationalization and accessibility, where, how else could we be thinking about web technologies to try and encourage the web to be a more ethical platform or a, a, to, to, have, to have the web be a platform that has society, that has a societal benefit at its core, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's really kind of the, my focus right now. I, I've been thinking about this a lot, how the web was originally designed to be a social benefit for people. And it's not, it's not just a place where you can buy more Pokemon dolls, even though that's a very worthy cause, don't get me wrong. Um, it's also a place that should be shielding your rights, that should be a platform that encodes human rights um, at the core of the, of, the, of the technology stack itself in some ways. And I mentioned privacy and security, internationalization, accessibility. Those are some very good examples. Um, we're also looking at things like, where, you know, where, where, else can, where else can we be encoding human rights, basically, into, into that core of a technology stack? So I read a blog post a little while back kind of talking about this, like the web, you know, with, with some ideas of some new technical principles or ethical principles, which we could then reduce into technical guidelines that we could actually, um, that the spec developers could actually be looking at or thinking about when they're developing their specs, right? Mm -hmm. So things like there is one web, right? The one web principle, which is actually not written down anywhere, right? We all kind of say, we all like to say, oh, there's one web. What does that, what does that mean? It, I mean, in one way, one web means I should be able to use any device, any um, platform, uh, any screen size, and I should get, by and large, a thematically consistent user experience. I should be seeing the same content on BBC if I view it on my, um, my phone as I do if I view it on the desktop. In another way, um, it also means uh, the web should not be enabling regional or national borders, right? It shouldn't. It, we we shouldn't have a web where you can't access certain content from uh, from certain locations. Um, that's uh, that's part of of being a one web. Rather, I should say, the web platform itself should not enable that. It should it should not be encoded into the web platform mm -hmm. to enable those kinds of regional so it's regional kind of barriers. Thing that, that that might happen due to like government um, interference on a national scale. Exactly. But it's not something that we as web platform architects It shouldn't be should built, enable. the hooks for that shouldn't be built into the web itself, right? Um, and so, so that, that, I think that's the important kind of like difference there. Um, the web should not be a detriment to society, right? So one of the things that we, that we thought about was um, when, you know, when adding a new technology to the web, you have to evaluate it uh, for the potential harm it could do. What could people be doing with this that could harm marginalized groups, for instance? Or, you know, because those kinds of use cases or abuse cases are often not thought about when you have a bunch of technologists that sit in a room together that are coming from a privileged position and they aren't thinking about maybe the needs of marginalized groups as much. So 
how can we make sure that we're encoding those that thinking and what we're thinking about those abuse cases potentially? Um, um, I have more. Yeah. But <laughs> so this this kind of makes me think for having this discussion as two white people um, in the UK. Yeah. Um, so what efforts are is the W3C doing to kind of encourage um, these discussions um, to not just be rooms full of white people having discussions about what is essentially a, te a technology for the entire world. Uh, I, that's, I think that's an incredibly important thing to think about right now. And the other talk I gave actually at the W3C advisory committee meeting um, last or uh, three weeks ago uh, where I actually shared the stage with Leona A. Watson mm. um, was about how W3C as an organization should be encouraging more um, people from diverse backgrounds, from marginalized communities, from um, traditionally underrepresented groups and nationalities and locations to uh, be participating in W3C, to be, to be, um, so how, so one way in which we're trying to do that is by uh, putting in place diversity scholarships, right? So last year at the TPAC meeting, which is the technical plenary and advisory committee meeting, which happens every year uh, in, it's a W3C week where a bunch of groups meet together in one place. Um, W3C only usually does this once a year, uh, unlike some other standards bodies which have set, you know, five, three or four or five meetings a year. W3C usually only has one week like this a year. And it can be extremely important for people to actually go to this, to this uh, TPAC week to see their colleagues, to um, have those corridor conversations, um, to get the kind of face-to-face uh, -face time with people uh, that enables them to have better understanding so that when then, then when the next week when they're on a conference call with somebody or a video call, it makes it very different. It makes it more difficult for you to, um, it, it makes it easier to get along basically. And it makes it, it, it allows work to get, to get done in, in a better way. So it can be really important for people to be able to attend meetings like that. So one of the things that we, that I actually, uh, suggested last year was that TPAC should have a diversity scholarship. Um, we at Samsung put a thousand pounds forward. Um, some other people at other companies, including Microsoft, put um, uh, money forward as well. Uh, we ended up being able to sponsor some number of candidates to come, or um, delegates rather, to come to um, uh, TPAC. So and we're doing that again this year, right? So that's, that's one way. So what does the, um... The diversity scholarship cover is it um, ticket to TPAC or it covers travel? it covers to it ticket it also covers travel that's the idea so so yeah. the, the it's 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 an all it's all inclusive and we're doing it again this year as I said I hope that we're going to have even more uh, funds to spend um, W3C is administering it I, you know um, we can leave I can leave a link in in the in the video here to, yes. to say what you know where what what the URL is to find out more. We're also taking that same approach to workshops. So another thing that W3C does is they run workshops. Um, we have participated in and shared a number of workshops. There was a workshop last year about um, permissions and consent, which was really pretty important. Um, uh, there's going to be another workshop coming up in July around web games. Uh, we've participated in and hosted a number of workshops around immersive web, web VR, web XR. Um, so increasingly, because we also want to bring those voices to workshops as well, because workshops are where new work is specked out, right? It's where people present papers and out of that comes a, or, a, or position statements, and out of that discussion comes often a charter for a working group that can include what the deliverables of that working group are going to be and what other, what the dependencies of that work are. So it's actually essential that we get those kinds of voices, underrepresented voices, in those workshops as well. And so we're working with W3C to try and make that happen. Um, and again, that would cover travel as well as what well. workshops don't generally have a fee, um, yeah. but it would cover travel. And travel is the main is the main issue.
Um, there are other blocking issues, of course. Many people don't have the time to spend. They can't afford to take the time away from work to go spend uh, uh, time on these things. Um, that's another set of challenges, and, and we need to figure out how to address those challenges, right? So, I mean, diversity scholarships isn't the whole answer. Um, we've, there, we've also got to create a more inclusive environment within W3C. And working with Svia, who is on the AB, uh, is uh, working on Workstream, which is the positive work environment task force, uh, where we're really trying to, W3C already have a code of conduct, which is the code of professional ethics, or code of professional conduct. Um, it needs an update. It's not up to date with the latest thinking around what codes of conduct need to look like and how specific they need to be, how detailed they need to be, um, and how proactive they need to be, right? And so we're actually, we've actually uh, interacted on a few threads yeah. uh, on GitHub. Again, that work is happening on GitHub. Um, I think that work is headed in the, right, in the right direction because the general consensus seems to be we need to update this and make it more in line with the best practices out there, things like the Contributor Covenant, for instance, that are really um, at the forefront of that. So, so that's all about helping W3C to be more inclusive so that it's not a place that once the people from the marginalized groups come to TPAC, they don't suddenly feel like this is not for me. This is not, you know, I'm not being listened to. I'm not being uh, asked what my opinion is. Um, this is very off-putting. The culture doesn't you know, culture doesn't work for me. That's the kind of stuff that we need to fix as well. So it's it's two there are two two major two major things there. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So the article you're going through here, this is the one you wrote. This is the one I wrote. Yeah, and 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 it's what it's essentially what I presented at at W3C as well, and and what I got. The feedback on so I've been not only have I been getting feedback from people in W3C community but I've also been reaching out to other communities and including academic ethicists um, to and, and people such as uh, the Web Foundation so the Web Foundation is another group that was uh, founded by Tim Berners-Lee um, and focuses more at the um, how shall I say at the uh, advocacy level, the uh, uh, working with governments, working with NGOs, um, more, it's more about opening the web and ensuring the life, the, 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 kind of the, the web at a, at a social level, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a work stream going on there called the Contract for the Web. Um, I participated in a call having to do with that earlier in the week. I was impressed by the commitment of the people that were involved in that call, including many people from NGOs and, and big companies as well, um, that, are, uh, that are really trying to make that, to flesh that out and to make that work. So we, we need to get that feedback, bring it back into this work that we're doing, and then create a set of principles. And I'm looking to do this in the next like three or four weeks, actually, is publish a first you know, real first draft sure. um, that we can then get, you know, some feedback on from the W3C community and we can kind of publish it as a tag output. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you consider like being in this document? Um, so besides things that I mentioned earlier about human rights, um, I think there are certain things that I talked about before, like internationalization, the web is for all people. Um, Low bandwidth networks, though, might also be uh, part of that, right? Like people who are on small uh, uh, footprint devices on low bandwidth networks need to be included in the web. So we need to make sure that when new web technologies are, are being developed, that the people that are working on them take, a, take that into account, take those issues into account. Um, security and privacy already mentioned. Um, freedom of expression is a really tough one yeah. right and we, we you gave me some good feedback on this as well I mean obviously the one of the functions of the web is to be a communication tool right and to level the playing field of communication so that anybody can communicate with anybody else so that anybody can share information with anybody else um, that is the primary social good that it was intended to to do um, now, in recent, you know, years, 
frankly. Um, there has been a trend towards a lot of negative speech, speech that has negative impact, like hate speech, for instance. And in some countries, hate speech is outlawed. In some, you know, it's, there's a real patchwork of regulatory around hate speech. Um, the so the web needs to enable freedom of expression but it should not be construed to mean that any service that is built on top of web technologies must enable unfettered uh, speech in my view and i think that's a that's a that's a that's an interesting balance to maintain so it should not we should not have people claiming that a specific I won't mention any names, but specific like broadcast services uh, that they cannot ban certain people uh, for being hate mongers uh, because free speech, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what the web enables freedom of expression means, but it does mean that at the core, the web should be enabling um, this right to the, the, the right of freedom of expression, which is a core human right. So like free speech up until the point at which it starts to impinge on the freedoms of others. Exactly, right, because that needs that needs to be subservient to the main goal of encoding human rights and of, of supporting human rights and having human rights at the core of the, of the thinking. This, is an, this was an interesting topic that came up in the Contract for the Web discussion as well. This is, this is at the fore of everybody's mind right now. Um, Truthfulness of information. The web must enable you being able to research the truthfulness of information. In fact, there's some work going on in W3C right now, the credible web uh, work, which is all about how can we put hooks into web technologies, into web standards that could actually um, better enable people to research the truthfulness of information or, better, or perhaps better enable people to write extensions for your browser that could um, flag when you are seeing something, when you're reading something that actually is not true or that actually has been debunked or, or stuff like that. So something to make it a lot easier to find the source of the news article you're reading. Exactly. And that source is a key architectural principle for the web, right? So because the web is built on top of many architectural layers and one of those architectural layers is origin and mm -hmm. HTTP origin or the, UR, the URL. Um, any web technology, the tag has tended to push back on any new web technology or trend that diminishes the importance of the URL or diminishes or, or, or breaks the web security model, which is based on origin, right? Because in that case, you are muddying the waters. You, don't, you might not actually know where the content uh, comes from. I'll give you a very specific example, which is Google AM. Um, so one of the exact same thing. This is, I mean, one of the criticisms that members of the tag had about Google AMP, but this, this, I think they're doing some things to address this, but it, it still is uh, continues to be an issue. Is when you um, see an article, when you do, when you make a search in your favorite search engine, and uh, you see an article right, and you're reading it right there, and the URL bar says uh, searchengine.com. Right, but the actual source of the article is evil.com, right, or you know, unreliable.com. Then, but how do you know that besides what your browser is telling you about where this article comes from, where where it is, where this is from? It becomes even more important if that piece of content that they're viewing actually requests some kind of permissions, like location permissions or the ability to send you. Um, push notifications or stuff like that, because then you're answering that question for google.com or for searchengine.com, yeah. uh, but you don't know you, that you've actually answered it for um, for content that's coming from unreliable.com. Does this, um, um, would this also apply for like Facebook, instant articles? It applies, it's exactly the same thing. It's uh, fashionable to, to hit uh, Google about this, but it, it, applies to the, it applies the same way for Facebook, Facebook Instant Articles, Apple News has the same issues. I mean, any time where uh, people are trying to create an experience where it kind of muddies the water between what the real um, origin of the information is and what URL you're seeing. Um, um, 
sustainability is another thing that we're that we're looking at. Like, um, how can we make sure that the web is green? How can we make sure that the web is at least not adding huge amounts of power consumption uh, to uh, uh, to an already very power thirsty uh, system? Um, the web is is not great when it comes to green uh, technology. It consumes a lot of power. Um, some of that is out of this out of scope for what we can do in W3C. But what? But but you know, is there something that we can think about? Could we be at least thinking about that when when, when we're at the design stage of new APIs? Is this going to drive the GPU quite a lot on your phone? Is this going to make your you run out of battery uh, quite easily? That that kind of stuff. Oh, that's um, a bit problematic for me as co-chair of the immersive web working group, where we we will eat up your camera and your GPU and, and run everything, your device as hot as it will go. So that's a, right. And that's, that's, that's the, that's the tension there, right? You want, you want and the people that are producing content for the immersive web, want it to be 60 frames per second and immersive and completely and that kind of thing. But you know, you're also running it on devices that first of all, that they, they get very hot and then they, then they shut down. Yeah. The minute they get too hot, and, and you end up with like you're watching like a uh, you're in a in a three D scene, and then suddenly it just says you need to take you need to you know take the phone out of the headset now because it's too hot. Um, but also, it doesn't match users' expectations with regards to how long their phone battery should last. You know that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, I guess when you're thinking about phones in particular that are plugged into headsets, that becomes more of an issue. But even so. You know, there's a balance there, and the balance we have to make sure that we, at the, at the that we enable that we put the hooks into the web platform so that service providers can enable that balance and can create content that, you know, is both green and um, and provides a great user experience somehow. Um, and by the way, there is one other thing that we have in the web which we talk about a lot which is this order of order of constituents priority of constituents right mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's often referred to by web by web specification by developers people in w3c um, they talk about what's the the primary uh, order of constituents order of pro the priority of constituents is First and foremost, the users, end users, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, user is a word that I'm trying to get out of my lexicon normally. So pe people, right? People mm -hmm. using the web. Um, and then secondary to that are things like the platform developer, um, the browser, so the browser developer, or the web application developer themselves. And then, you know, at the very bottom of the list is theoretical purity, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that... Order of constituents is something that people talk about a lot, but actually, you know what? Doing some research, I found it wasn't it wasn't ever written down in a in what I would call a stable place. It's been written in a few different places, um, but uh, actually having it written down in a tag document uh, would probably give it more longevity. So that's another area. That's another ethical principle that probably we need to apply to the web. And there are a few other things here, but I, I mean, I, I'll leave the URL. Um, I think the web being inspectable is another key issue, maybe, um, where it's important that the web was built. A lot of people who grew up on the web or, or learned development by learning the web learned it through the view through view source, right? Yeah. Now. With the current way that the web works, view source, view source itself is not often very useful because you you're not getting by view source. You mean when you right click on the page and go view, view source. source. That's right. And yeah. then you see the the underlying HTML and CSS and JavaScript. That's right. And that allows you as a developer to say, oh, that's neat. Now I see how they did that. I can steal that and I can use it in my thing. And that's how that's how web development works. That's how developers operate, and that really helps to to share knowledge and that kind of thing. But Currently, I would say the way, the more likely thing that you are to do as a web developer is to bring up developer tools and inspect what's going on. And that, that inspectability is now really important for 
uh, not only is it important for developers to learn uh, what's going on, but it's also important for, say, you're a, um, say you're a web extension developer that wants to develop an extension that is telling people about the truthfulness of information that they might see on the web. Well, being able to inspect the websites of the 100 most popular um, you know, news sources uh, is pretty important in understanding what they're doing under the cover so that you can build an extension that can then uh, apply itself correctly to those to those web pages. So it's it's that inspectability is a is a key factor that keeps the web honest, yeah. right? And um, and and it also is part of like not having any black boxes in the web. So, so that, keeping it machine readable as well as yeah, human readable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's right. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking about right now. You know, that's that's kind of on, on my on my mind. Has it made sense? Did it make sense? I think it made sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, is there anything you want the people who watch this video to, to take away from it and to check out? Well, keep tabs of what we're doing in the tag through our GitHub. You can take a look at our GitHub at our issues register uh, in design in our design repos. Um, I'll leave a link to, to that alongside of this video. You can also uh, keep tabs on us through our Twitter, which is W3C tag. Um, we're running developer events. Our next one is coming up in Reykjavik on the 21st of May. Um, that's going to be exciting. It's the first time I've ever been to Reykjavik, and I'm hoping that we're going to get some developers uh, coming to our developer event there. So if you live in Reykjavik or near Reykjavik, then please come along. Um, but keep track of where we're meeting in the future, too, because more than, like, well, more than likely, we're going to be having a developer uh, event wherever we meet. Fantastic. Um, um, would you say following the tag through GitHub is a good way to keep a track of a high level overview of all the exciting things happening in the web? Definitely. I mean, I think following us on Twitter is also going to be important. You know, um, there's a lot of stuff. Our, our GitHub can get pretty chaotic. So we try and cover the main points there. We also, if you're interested and you have a lot of time, uh, all of our minutes are posted on GitHub, right? And not only that, but when you take a look at our uh, meetings repo, you'll be able to see the agenda for our coming meetings, our coming calls, and we actually publish a viewable um, live minutes URL uh, where if you care to tune in during uh, that time, you can actually see our minutes being taken live. I mean, we're that serious about being kind of radically transparent oh, in amazing. the tag. So, uh, uh, so all our minutes are, are 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 public and you know all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, yeah, definitely the main work that we're doing these days is in the design reviews repo, and and it's in the issues uh, that we're having a lot of I'll uh, put those a discussions link down below. <laughs> cool. Um, well, I think that does everything. Uh, thank you so much for for coming to speak with me today. It's been it's been really nice. And um, I'm sure I'll get to speak to you again really soon. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank Bye, you. everyone.